And now it is my honor to introduce our class day student speaker, Peter James Kiernan. By now, <laughs> by now, many of you know Peter's background. Special operations in the Marines, COVID response, and as he'll tell you within 20 minutes of meeting him, a diehard New Yorker. <laughs> usually, that's enough, but what you won't find in his bio is that you can usually find him riding around on campus on his longboard, taking hits on the rugby field, including a broken rib, which he says was worth it to beat both Yale and Wharton this year, woo, woo, woo. or supporting veterans on campus as the CFO of the Armed Forces Alumni Association. He's also been spotted rowing the men's eight at the head of the Charles, appropriately representing HBS on the river behind us by wearing business attire with white shirts, red ties. It's, it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> We're all extremely proud to have Peter speak on behalf of our class today. Please join me in welcoming Class Day student speaker, Peter James Kiernan. Thank you, Brandon. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me start by extending a warm welcome to the family and friends here with us today. When this journey to business school began, we all sat down and crafted an application that attempted to create a narrative out of our life experiences. Behind every one of those stories are the people who helped shape them and, more fundamentally, shape us. We sit before you today because of the unseen generosity of mentors, friends, and family. So thank you for being here to share in this important day, but more importantly, for being the foundation of our narratives. To our beloved partners, thank you for putting up with the treks and the theme parties, indulging our hectic social calendars, and for being there when we needed to vent about the cold calls. <laughs> I'd also like to give a heartfelt thank you to all the students, staff, and faculty who have made today possible. To April and Brandon uh, and the rest of the SA leadership, thank you for spending the precious hours of your final semester planning and orchestrating everything. To the staff, thank you for your tireless effort, not just today, but every day throughout the pandemic to give us an experience worthy of HBS. And last but not least, to the faculty for conducting the symphony of our class discussions, for imparting us with knowledge and wisdom, and for giving us the tools to make a difference. Thank you. Let's give them another hand. If you'll indulge me a few special shout outs to my discussion group, to the AFAA rugby and boat clubs for being great friends and helping make great memories. And of course, a big shout out to the intrepid Section I. <laughs> for always being there for me. <laughs> now to the serious stuff. To all of my fellow students, the pandemic class of 2022, congratulations on making it to the finish. I am filled with gratitude to be here, off Zoom and in person, to see your smiling faces as we take this next step together. Our class boldly embraced uncertainty, electing to come to HPS during a pandemic despite not knowing what that journey would bring. We created shared bonds through common experiences, from our first and extremely awkward interactions on Slack and Zoom, to small group dinners, where we learned how tall people really were. <laughs> Looking for you, Kate. <laughs> to being in the classroom and seeing our professors and friends unmasked for the first time. We came to HBS as strangers, except for those of you who came from Goldman or McKinsey, of course. <laughs> and now, we're leaving not only as future colleagues, but as friends. From here, our stories diverge as we continue down our own separate paths. So I thought it fitting to spend these parting words talking about the mission 
of HBS, since it is in part what has drawn us together. If we've heard this once, we've heard it 100 times. The mission of Harvard Business School is to educate leaders who will make a difference in the world. There's an irony here. We've spent two years discussing the hard concepts of business, but comparatively less time discussing the nebulous nuances of what it means to make a difference. We leave here with this crucial charge, but little guidance about what it entails or how to fulfill it. So that's what I'd like to reflect on today. When we should make a difference, what it should be, how to measure it, and how it can be achieved. The first question is when. When should we make a difference? There's a misconception that, given the size of the challenges facing the world, from the pandemic to climate change to the invasion of Ukraine, only powerful people can make a difference. This line of thinking leads us into a trap, because if our impact needs to be global, we think we must wait until we have the capacity to operate on a larger scale. But our time is finite. And deferring this obligation is dangerous because we can miss opportunities to make a difference now. Most importantly, we don't always get to choose the moments in which we can make a difference. Sometimes they choose us. So I'm going to tell you a story that has clarified my thoughts about our mission. This story takes place last August, trekking through Peru with my wife, when the news in Afghanistan started to turn sour. As a veteran who had served there, it was traumatic, watching everything I had fought for come crashing down as the country collapsed. My heart broke as I thought of my friends who had died there, the pain of the Afghan people, and the sacrifices we made all being washed away. And in this moment, I started to receive frantic WhatsApp messages from my old interpreter, Hawk. Though I had been in touch with him sporadically, trying to help him get a visa to the United States, I hadn't seen Hawk since I left Afghanistan almost 10 years ago. But now, his situation was getting desperate. Our missions had brought these interpreters face to face with the Taliban helping us fight, capture, and question them. Now, Hawk was being targeted by the Taliban, who were roaming free and empowered to seek vengeance. With the Afghani government collapsed and Americans gone, grim retribution was all but assured. Hawk was fleeing just ahead of the Taliban advance with his wife and his three young children. I've tried, and I still can't imagine what he felt in those moments. Running for his life, his worst nightmares come alive. And his best chance at survival is texting some guy that he worked with a decade ago, who is now an HBS student on vacation. Not my first choice for help. <laughs> Suffice it to say, I didn't get a choice of when Hawk needed my help. In this moment of crisis, the when became right now. Thinking back to the mission, they don't really tell us what the difference we're supposed to be making is either. There's more to making a difference than just creating profits and capturing value. While I can't tell you what your difference should be, I can tell you mine. I've always felt an obligation to give back by helping others, to pay for the privileges I have received by luck of birth. We all have different purposes, but the intersection of your talent, passion, and a positive impact on society is where you'll find your difference. So it was clear at this point that there was no one else who was going to help Hawk. For all the promises our government gave, this family and thousands of others were overlooked. And I knew the cavalry wasn't coming. I did the only thing that made sense. I put the rest of our trip on hold booked a hotel with decent Wi-Fi, and stayed glued to my phone. I didn't know how long it would take to get them out, or if it was even possible, but I had to try. I leveraged every contact I could think of 
and joined an army of volunteers that sprang into action overnight, whose ranks, I'm proud to say, include a number of our classmates here today. I wrote op-eds and did interviews. I spoke to members of Congress and State Department officials. I sourced intelligence from dozens of group chats. I found an old Marine buddy who was in the same situation with his interpreter, Khalid. We joined forces, creating a ragtag team and a rough plan. We were able to get the two families conditional visas and figured out the safest routes to the Kabul airport. We made contact with the Marines on the ground guarding those gates and got those approvals in their hands. We linked Hawk and Khalid together and tried to get them positioned so they could be pulled through the right gate. But despite their frantic attempt to get to the entrance, the last 200 meters of the corral leading to the gate were so tightly packed that it was impossible to move. It was an impenetrable wall of bodies. Past the point of exhaustion, after standing in the unrelenting heat for 48 hours with no food, water, bathrooms, or shelter, and fearing that their children would not survive the crush of the crowd, the group had to turn back, and I had failed. My plan had been foiled by a crowd of people simply too dense to move through. So how do we measure our difference in the world? What's the magnitude? Many of you would choose paths that lead to increasing worlds of wealth, and prestige, and power, leading companies or even countries. You will have big titles and do big things. It is easy to understand success through the heuristic of expanding responsibilities and influence. But I think there's another way to measure impact. What I'm talking about is the tension between breadth and depth. Helping people and changing someone's life doesn't need to be done from positions of power and influence. We all have the capacity to make a profound change in people's lives. Every one of us is here because of mentors, friends, and family who in some way shaped our values and broadened our perspectives. They inspired us, sacrificed for us, and gave us direction. We are here, in short, because of depth. What I'm saying is, it is unlikely that our difference should be measured by multiple expansion, EBITDA growth, or a good IRR. Although they're useful tools, in some cases, like in my FIM models, <laughs> the assumptions are just flat out wrong. <laughs> Maybe, instead, we should be comparing how much of a difference we've made in the world of just one other person. So we knew the window was closing in Afghanistan, and if we waited much longer, we would never get our people out. Despite being demoralized and exhausted, the team, the team tried to work out alternative plans. After an intense period of coordinating with troops on the ground, my teammates managed to get our two families in a location where a squad of soldiers could extract them. They were miraculously pulled into the airport and whisked away on a flight to safety. Against all odds, all 10 of them made it out. In fact, I have the joy of having Hawk and Khalid here today as my honored guests. Welcome, my friends. Assalamu alaikum, Mama Guri. Haq Khalid, while you may not be from the United States, you embody this country's deepest values and highest aspirations. Your loyalty, bravery, and commitment to freedom are unparalleled. 
You served and fought for a better future, not for weeks and months, but for years, at enormous personal risk. You have made a difference in many lives, including my own. And while this struggle has been long and unkind, it is my great hope that America will honor its debt to you and provide you and your children with the safety and opportunity you deserve. Let me and the people gathered here with us today be the first to thank you for your service. You are an inspiration to us all. Please stand and be recognized. I want to be clear about something. I was not a part of those final and miraculous moments of their evacuation. Drained and exhausted after a week of this effort and having stayed awake for over 36 hours during our last attempt, I was asleep. It was the team that carried them those last yards to the finish, which is my final point. You can't change the world by yourself. We are no longer individual contributors. All of us will find ourselves creating a difference by choosing teams and leading others. And though we will stumble in the great struggle to make a difference in this world, in those inevitable moments of personal weakness, look to your left and to your right, look to each other, and look to the team for strength. Helping get Haq, Khalid, and their families out of Afghanistan didn't fundamentally change the course of the tragedy. Just days later, a suicide bomber destroyed that same gate, killing hundreds of Afghans and a dozen of my fellow Marines, effectively ending the evacuation of civilians and leaving tens of thousands of people behind. Still, the work of average people made a world of difference to those who did escape. The problems of the world are so big, so multifaceted, that we can't measure success in terms of total victory. For me, it was enough to see Khalid's happy three-year-old daughter safe in the United States doing an excited dance when I brought her a pizza. The mission of HBS is to educate leaders who will make a difference in the world will, not might or should. It is both a prophecy and a command. It's a requirement, an obligation. One of the most profound comments I've ever heard in the classroom is that this MBA degree is not an asset, but a liability. It's a debt, which carries a responsibility to make payments in the form of a difference, helping get Hawk and Khalid out of Afghanistan was an advance, an installment, a coupon clipped to pay down an obligation that we all share, an obligation to make the world a better place. We can't do it alone. We can't sacrifice depth for breath. And we can't afford to wait. Thank you.